first met James Kennard at a Shabbat dinner at the home of a friend, Rabbi Kennard, you will remember that, and he told me two things, one of which I queried immediately. Like all mathematicians, and uh, James holds a degree in mathematics from Oxford University, James believes that everyone can do maths. Anybody who knows me that I am living proof, James, that it is not so. <laughs> and the second thing that Rabbi Kennard told me, and the passage of time since he commenced a few years ago as principal of Mount Scopus College, has also given me cause to question it. And that is, he told me, and I quote him, he told me that he holds a bottom draw smicha, a bottom draw rabbinical ordination or rabbinic qualifications. Rabbi James Kennard, ladies and gentlemen, has emerged as one of Melbourne, Melbourne Jewry's most articulate and sought after rabbis. And Rabbi, a Jewish educator of great experience and educator par excellence, his impact on the Jewish community over the few years that he's been with us has been absolutely outstanding. And it is a privilege and a pleasure to invite him and to welcome him to the podium to address us on why be Jewish, answers that educators can offer to the question of our age. Rabbi. I feel quite humbled and a little bit uncomfortable standing here for two related reasons. And one is that looking down the list of keynotes, I noticed that the keynote speakers are, as is usually the case in a conference like this, outsiders, either from abroad or from outside the profession, coming in to address the assembly from an external perspective. I'm not an outsider. After nearly four years here, I feel very much an insider. And therefore, I wonder why I've been given this particular dubious distinction of being a keynote speaker. I think it might be something about my friendship with Michael, which I've exploited on this occasion. There is a text that says, and it's often quoted, Ain Navi the Iro, someone is not a prophet in one's own city. Having said that, that text is the New Testament, so perhaps we don't need to apply it in this case. The other reason that I'm humbled is that I don't claim to present in the next few minutes anything new, and I am sure that many of the topics that I'm going to touch upon have been, dwelt, have been dealt with by others at greater length and quite probably greater degree of expertise. And therefore, what I would like to aim to do in this presentation is simply to share some of my ideas, some of my thinking, so that it should provoke discussion and more thoughts amongst colleagues. So the title is, Why Be Jewish? Answering the Question of Our Age. And the first thing I want to stress is that this is the question of our age in a way that Jewish history has never experienced before. Now, one manifestation of it, and we heard the figures this morning, is the degree of assimilation, of which the key proxy indicator is the degree of intermarriage. It is well known that we look at America and we think they've lost it. Their intermarriage rate, well over 50% now. The number of Jews in America dwindling, disappearing before our eyes. And we think we're pretty much okay down here in Australia. We know that we're not. We know that if we look at the key demographic, the key marrying age, 25 to 39, the intermarriage rate is about 40%. If you add in cohabiting couples, it's probably pushing 50%. And let's just think what that means. Given that, or no, it's not necessarily the case, but usually the children of intermarried couples grow up with very limited Jewish identity, if at all, and certainly the grandchildren, even less than that. We're talking about losing nearly half of our people each generation. That means after two generations, even on present trends, there'd only be a quarter of us left. That's the horrific nature of the degree of assimilation that we have at the moment. Now, as I say, 
Intermarriage is a key proxy indicator, and intermarriage is to some extent a critical point of no return. But of course the problem is much wider than that. The problem is disengagement leading to disappearance. And it's never been like this before. It's never been so easy to disengage and disappear. In fact, today, for the first time in history, one has to positively engage. If we go back to the ancient kingdom of Israel, Judaism and nationality were one and the same thing. It's only when we went into exile that the concept of religion and Jews defined by their religious identity emerged. That's why the word dat first appears in the book of Esther, which is the first book to be written describing an exiled community. And then when we go to, let's say, the Middle Ages, we have a period where it is possible to convert out of Judaism. But it's hard work. It takes a lot of effort. And even in these post-Enlightenment times in the last two centuries, when assimilation has become much more of an option, nevertheless, until recently, it's been a positive choice. I choose to leave Jewish life. I choose to disengage from the Jewish community. Where our young people have so many choices, and in our liberal society, so many choices are valid and legitimate. We need to give our young people reasons to stay Jewish. And the ultimate question, therefore, that we as educators face is not some esoteric debate about the afterlife or the coming of the Messiah, or even the rights and wrongs of the Arab-Israeli conflict, relevant though those questions are. The question that we have to answer is why be Jewish? And we have to think of answers that we can give to our students, to our Hanichim, that will resonate, that will make sense. Because in another sense, that's not the ultimate question, that's the sort of the big philosophical question. The ultimate question is a very particular one, albeit theoretical. The ultimate question that we have to have a good answer to is why should I not marry my non-Jewish boyfriend or girlfriend? That's the question, and that's the key question. What can we give which is more powerful, more attractive, than the person whom they want to marry? Now, of course, I say that question is hypothetical, because if that question is actually asked in reality, it's too late to answer it. But what we have to give our young people is enough answers in advance, so the question's never asked. We have to make Judaism and being Jewish and being a part of the Jewish community so attractive and so logical that the question is not asked. So I'd like to survey, first of all, some answers, three particular answers, which our young people often come across, maybe from schools, most likely from parents and grandparents. And I think these answers are either deficient or simply wrong. And the first answer, which we often find our young people presented with, is, well, don't give up on being Jewish. It's been going for a long time. It's a chain of 200 generations, of 3,000 years. How can you break the chain? And I remember, not long ago, trying to give this answer in a discussion with a year 10 student about the possibilities of assimilation. And she turned to me and said, well, maybe it's been going for 200 generations, but maybe each one of those generations was wrong. And it struck me as she was right. We live in an age post the Enlightenment, which can perhaps be summed up as the triumph of experience over tradition, where our way of thinking, both in science and philosophy, and indeed in religion, is just because our parents did it, that is no reason why I should do it. And in fact, on the contrary, if our parents did it, that's probably a reason why I shouldn't do it. So to say not only have your parents been doing this, but your grandparents and your great-grandparents going back to the dawn of time, doesn't cut it. It's no logical reason why just because it's been going for a long time, I should have to carry it on. After all, malaria's been going for a long time, we've tried to get rid of that. <laughs> and so the first answer that just because it's old is not actually an attractive feature. And in fact, by deliberately using the word old, we can realize why it's perhaps even unattractive to our children. The second answer, which is often given, 
Uh, and I have to say, particularly in Australia, and I say this as, as a newcomer, is you should be Jewish, and you should stay Jewish, because the Jewish people have suffered. And in particular, of course, you should be Jewish because your grandparents, your great-grandparents, went through the Holocaust. And like it or not, that is the message that many of the young people get. But the reason they should stay Jewish, the reason they should marry Jewish, is because the Jewish people have suffered. And I have great problems with this line of reasoning. Now, let me stress that, of course, we should learn about our history. And our history has often been bloodstained. And, of course, we should learn about one of the two defining moments of the 20th century, and perhaps of all time, and that is the Holocaust. But to present the Holocaust as a reason for staying Jewish is vacuous. First of all, there is no logic. Because my grandparents suffered, I should, that should affect whom I marry. Doesn't make sense to me. And it doesn't make sense to our clever, thinking, critical, analytical young people. And it's a problem that we have when we present Jewish history as nothing but rivers of blood. Not only is that not true, it's not exactly a way to make Jewish life particularly attractive. And it's quite a logical proposition for young people, either consciously 